Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. As you can see, we are starting a new series today called Family Ties. And I'll get into that in just a minute, but I want to take a minute and look into the camera and welcome all of our family who's joining us online, wherever you are watching from or whenever you are watching from. And a special shout out to Upshur County Jail. Come on, South Campus. Let's tell them how much we love them. We love you so much. We're grateful that you're taking some time to be with us today. And before I get into the series, I want to make one other quick announcement. And that is upcoming in September, we have what's called the Unite Leadership Conference, September 15th. And if you're unfamiliar with Unite, I sit on the board of Unite Leadership. It started with a group of pastors and leaders in this community who wanted to see unity among churches and believers and leaders to see change happen in East Texas. And so we started this organization and out of that came uh, Transformation Longview after spending some time with John Maxwell and that is about community transformation. So we're doing a lot of things to try to see East Texas continue to grow and change and really we wanna see the kingdom of heaven come in our area. But one thing we do is every year we, th we throw a leadership conference and we have speakers come out and I want you all to see that you are leaders because wherever you are, you have influence in your family, at your work, at your school. And so this year, we have Dr. Caroline Leaf and uh, Dr. Darius Daniels. And Dr. Caroline Leaf is a neuroscientist and has wrote many books that talks about how to rewire your brain. And she just proves uh, that science proves what the scripture has already told us, that you can renew your mind. And when you renew your mind, you train your brain to think differently. And so uh, you'll be greatly encouraged by what she's sharing, as well as Dr. Darius Daniels, who is a pastor, an author, and a leadership coach. And so I promise you, you won't regret coming and there is just one low rate this year. Before, in the past, we have done different tiers of seating. Every seat is the same price, so it's a first come, first serve. So I want to encourage you to go to uniteandlead.com and get your tickets today because we are a month away from that. Okay? Everybody's going to be there, right? Yeah. All right, that's what I wanted to hear. Okay. All right, let's go on to the series that we're in, Family Ties. And how many of you recognize that song? You remember this show? How many remember Family Ties? Okay, you're showing your age a little bit in this one. Uh, but I remember it. It was a show from the 80s. Really, I think it ran from like 82 to 89. And it was in that decade and that era where, and I guess the 90s as well, where there were a lot of uh, family comedies, family shows. And uh, this particular one I always thought was funny because the parents in this show uh, were, grew up in the 60s and they were you know, kind of hippies. And then they had this family where the main kid, I mean, they have other kids, but the only one I really cared about was Alex P. Keaton, who was Michael J. Fox. Uh, who, you know, it was amazing because of Back to the Future. But uh, Alex Keaton was a businessman as a kid. I mean, he would go to class wearing a suit with a tie and a briefcase, and he read the Wall Street Journal, and he was the president of the Young Republicans Club. And so it was so vastly different than his parents. Um, but it, so it made for good comedy. But what I loved about these shows is that you would get to see family drama and you'd get to see problems, but they were all wrapped up in 30 minutes, right? <laughs> everything was resolved in 30 minutes. How many of you would like for everything in your family to be resolved in 30 minutes? Yeah, and some of you are here today going, 30 minutes, it's been 30 years and I'm still having problems, right? And don't worry, this series is not about that show. We just stole the title. But the reality is, is because there's so much drama in families, when we talk about a family series, or even mention family, it can elicit a lot of different feelings, a lot of different emotions. Some of you, when you heard the word family or you found out we were doing a family series, it brought joy to you. You got excited, but for some of you, you got sad. For some of you, maybe it brought up feelings of hurt or pain. Some of you, you felt a little bit disappointed. Or maybe there was a fear of the future or maybe a fear of repeating the past. So family can elicit all of these different emotions, all of these different feelings, and not everybody has the same idea of family because the best moments of our life revolve around family and the most painful and the most difficult moments of our life revolve around family. Yeah. It's deep. It elicits deep emotion and feeling. But how many of you nobody can, how many of you know that nobody can encourage you like family and nobody can hurt you like family? 
This, you know, when, when, when someone else says something about you that you don't like, it doesn't feel great. But if those words were by a father, if those words were by a mother, if those words were by your kids, if those words were by your spouse, it hurts a lot more. It cuts deep because they, they see every part of you, the good and the bad. But to that same token, those same people, when they encourage you and they speak life and healing to you, there's nobody that has the power to heal with their words like your family, right? I mean, other people can give me encouragement, and that's awesome. But when my wife encourages me, it, there's something different. I mean, she's a natural encourager already. It's one of her gifts, which I believe God knew I must have needed uh, because he gave me somebody who encourages a lot. But her words mean a lot to me. Her touch means a lot to me. You know, my, one of my love languages is touch with her. I just want to make that clear. So not everybody comes up to me and is trying to touch me and hug me like, I love you, but it doesn't do the same thing, Okay. I can be struggling, I can be hurting, and she can just walk by and touch my shoulder, and it's like peace comes in. It's like everything's all right, you know? Because family has the power to heal as well. There, there's so much wrapped up when it comes to talking about family. But what's made it difficult is family has become complicated. How many of you would agree with that? Family is complicated. And to add to that, what used to be the norm when it comes to family would be called what culture would call a nuclear family, where there was a mother and a father and children, and there was nothing brought from the outside in. But that's not the norm anymore. In fact, statistics show that 40 up to 50% of society is in a blended family. And we have a lot of amazing blended families in our church and a lot of amazing blended families I know that join online, and God is doing incredible things through and in your family. But that has become the norm where two families are coming together. So you're bringing some different things from different backgrounds and you're blending them into one, kind of like the Brady Bunch. The Brady Bunch brought two families together. So what complicates it is you have now different backgrounds. You have stepmothers and fathers. You have stepkids. You have grandparents raising kids. You have single parents. And so all of these things just add other layers to the complication of family that could bring either more hurt or more joy. But what I know to be true is that in the Bible, the language of the Bible is family. All throughout the scripture from the beginning to end, it talks about family. God knew that we would live in a culture in a time where it could be complicated. So he, he used the language of family all throughout scripture to reveal some things to us. In the New Testament, Jesus shows up on the scene and he did something that would have been considered controversial. He called God his father. He introduced the idea of God as our father, a familial, intimate relationship. And in many ways, that's the perfect family relationship. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That they are perfect in unity. There was transparency. They're all in oneness. That's the picture of the family that we all would love to have. But I know that in the Bible, God uses this language of family, and he chooses to work generationally. Even from the very beginning, think about the very beginning. God created Adam, and what did he say in Genesis 2? It's not good for this man to be alone. So what did he do? He brought Eve out of his side, and the first marriage was formed right there. And then God said, be fruitful and multiply. So they had kids. So we see the first institution of marriage and family was the very beginning of humankind. It was God's idea. It is God's plan. He's the one that chooses to work generationally. There's so much power in the family. And I believe that nothing reveals the heart and the character and the nature of God like family, like the father relationship, like, like the marriage relationship between Christ and the church that shows us the picture uh, of who we are supposed to be. There is identity in family. In fact, I would say it this way, that family gives us identity. Family gives us identity. You, you get physical traits from your family. Some of you, that's a good thing. Some of you may not be that happy about it, right? I mean, there's no way I could ever be tall. Like, I got physical traits from my family that have kept me where I am. Uh, I'm blaming it on them. No, but, th but there are so many things that gives you identity from your family, from the way you look, from the way you act, to your name. Your family names you, your first name and your last name. And many people are even known simply by their last name because it's a part of their identity. And it's not just in the natural Family gives us identity in the supernatural, that you become a part of the family of God and now you take on his name. And so it's a part of the identity that we're supposed to get from family. That was his plan from the very beginning. 
And that's why he introduced himself to many people as I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I'm a generational God. I bless generationally. I work generationally. I work in and through family. And I believe this is why marriage and the family unit has come under attack so much in our culture. If you have not noticed it, the, the picture of marriage, the sanctity of marriage, the idea of marriage, the idea of family, what is a family, it is all under an all-out attack from the enemy. Because he knows, and it's a brilliant idea, honestly, that if he could get in and cause there to be cracks in the foundation of how you see your father, if he can remove a father out of the home, if he can set kids against their parents and parents against their kids, if he can set husband against the spouse and spouse, wife against the husband, if he can do that, He'll cause there to be a fracture in your relationship with God because he's our father and Jesus, we're his bride. So if I were going to try to mess up a relationship, I would try to cause fractures in the picture of what it looks like to have that relationship. And that's what marriage and family is. And this is why we must talk about this because there's everything trying to tear it down. So we have to look at what the Bible says to build it back up. And if we were going to have a theme verse for this series, this is what it would be in Psalm 127 verse one. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And this, this whole Psalm, it's about five or six verses. It is about family because it goes on to say that children are a blessing from the Lord. And it goes on to talk about arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. And we're going to talk about some of that But I want you to know this is talking about your home and your family. And it's important we look at it because unless God's building it, we're wasting our time. And I don't want you to get to a point in your life that you're like, I've been building it wrong this whole time. How many of you know, if you ever built something at home, like I'm a dad, so I build a lot of things at home, not like things out of like my mind. They're boxes that I get, by the way, and I'm not, I'm not that creative. But it's like cribs, and and you put together toys, and you put together bunk beds. If you've ever built those, especially if it's from Ikea, you get an Allen wrench and a bunch of drawings, and you got to figure it out. If you get all the way through, and you realize, I built this wrong, like part A is supposed to be over here, and I can't even get into the crib now because it's it's built wrong. What do you have to do? you got to take it apart, at least back to where you went wrong, and start building it again. And for some of you in this series, you're going to have to unbuild some things, some take some things apart in order to rebuild it right, because I don't want you to labor in vain. I don't want you to wake up one day and be like, I've worked so hard and I never got the thing I was trying to build. In fact, in the next verse, in verse two, it says, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Isn't it true? That in our lives, most of the things that cause sleeplessness or anxiety or worry revolve around our family. How we're going to provide, what's going to be in the future. Am I going to be able to take care of the kids? What, What if my spouse leaves me? What if my kids never come home? What if they never give their life to Jesus? All of those things can cause us to stay up, be anxious, and and be worried all the time. And he's saying, "I, I want you to let me build it so you don't have to be worried, so you can sleep well at night, so that anxiety will go and fear will go. And those are the things that we're going to look at in this series. We're going to look at God's plan. So I want to establish a couple of things right off the bat. Two things that I know to be true here, that every one of us has a family and every one of us has a home. Now you may be going, I don't have a family. Every one of us has a mother or a father or and a father, unless there are virgin births I don't know about (laughs) besides Jesus, right? Every one of us has some family relationship somewhere. They may not be here. You may have a sibling somewhere else, an aunt or an uncle, you know, a spouse. You may be a grandparent or have grandparents. There are some type of family relationship, including the family of God that we're in. But also every one of us has a home, right? It may be a dorm room for you. It may be your bedroom if you live with your parents. It, it, It may be an assisted living home or apartment or duplex. Every one of us has a family though and every one of us has a home. Home is where you make it, right? So wherever you are, you're responsible for that environment to some degree. And I want you to realize wherever family you're in, you're responsible for that to some degree. So if we've established these two things, the question then becomes, do you have hope for your family and hope for your home? What is your dream for them? What, what is it that you would want to, to have in the future? And I'm praying that if you don't have one, that you get one. And I'm praying that if you do have one, you're open today to what God says about it. So 
I want to look at hope for your family and hope for your home today. And I want to start by looking at a story that's a very familiar story in Mark chapter 10. It's the story of the rich young ruler. It's a famous passage in the Bible, and I want to read through some of it and pull some things out of it. So let's jump into Mark chapter 10, verse 17. It says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him and knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And in some ways, what this man is doing, he seemingly has everything. He's, he realizes there's something he doesn't have that he wants, and he's coming and asking, what must I do to get what I want? And I think it's interesting that many of us can approach God this way for things in our life. Yeah. What must I do to get what I want? Just tell me the steps I got to take to get to the thing that I'm really trying to get to. Yeah. What do I have to do to get my spouse to act right? <laughs> You may come to this series and be like, what do I got to do to get my kids to act right? Because Lord, you know they're bad. You know I got some baby's kids at home, right? You, you know. So I just need the steps. Just give me the, what do I got to do to get to the house that I really want? That house with the white picket fence, the house that's three stories or whatever, you know. What do I have to do? We can all come wanting the things to do. I'm a list guy. I like lists. I like to know the steps of what I got to do. How many of you are C personality on the disc test? Any C in here? Okay. If you don't know what the disc test is, just a quick reminder, step two of our next steps process is today at 12 o'clock. You don't have to clap. You don't have to clap. But it is where you find out your personality and how God wired you, right? Talk to somebody and we'll help you get to that class today. But the C personality, they like to know the steps. They want to know the, the rules. They want to follow those steps to get to what they want, right? And we can all do that to some degree where we can come to God and say, just tell me what I got to do to get to what I want. And, and Jesus knew that this is kind of what this man was coming to him with. And so he said to this man in the next verse, in verse 18, he said, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. He's, he's starting to reveal some things about his heart. But then pick up in verse 19 and look at what it says here. It says, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Then he goes on to say, you must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commands since I was young. Uh, he's saying, I've done everything. Look at how good I am. Then he goes on in the next verse to say, Jesus says, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Yeah. And I love that because even knowing his heart, Jesus felt genuine love for him. And maybe you just needed to hear that today, that God doesn't look at you and is disappointed with everything that you're doing. He feels genuine love for you and he wants something better for you than you want for yourself. So it says he felt genuine love for him and he says, there's still one thing you haven't done. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then it says, then come and follow me. And at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. And I know most of you may have heard this story before, and this is the sad part of the story. Not only is this man sad, we're sad reading it, right? Why is it sad? Because he wanted a list of things so he could get to what he wanted, but he really couldn't do the thing that God was asking him to do. And what this reveals to him and what it reveals to us is that oftentimes we can say, well, God, I'll give you my actions. I'll keep all of the commands. I'll do everything that you're asking me to do. But we've given him our actions, but we really haven't given him our heart. We, we've done all of the right things, but really we can do the right things let me go there, with the wrong motivation. This is what religion is. It's doing all the right things to get what we want, but doing it with the wrong heart. You see, if we're honest with ourselves, we can do this in our families. We can do the right things, but have the wrong motivation for it. Like we can parent the right way, but not so our kids will turn out great, but so they'll make us look great. We can, we can want to have a great marriage, and not, not so that we can give God glory with our marriage, but so that people will think, I want to have a marriage like them. That's awesome. They got it really going on. 
See, we, we can do all the right things, but it's really about the heart. This is the thing God is always after is the motivation with which we do it, the heart with which we do it. And sometimes we'll come to God and say, tell me the right things to do so I can get the marriage I want. Tell me the right things that I can do so I can get the family I want. Tell me the right things that I can do so I can get to my finances the way I want them to be. But our heart motivation is not right in it. It's not to honor God with it. It's so that we can have what we want. And I think it's important as we start this series that we're faced with the same issue that this man was faced with. And really, it's the message of the gospel. It's the message that Jesus preached over and over again. And what he was getting across in this same story, and that is this, is that, we'll go to the next slide, I'm sorry. You can only truly have what you're willing to let go of. You can only really have what you're willing to let go of. And in this case, the man couldn't let go of his possessions. It's what he really wanted, but he still couldn't trust God with it. He couldn't really give it up. And, and I know that people will read this story, and I've heard people tell me, you know, oh, well, it's this story that proves that Jesus is against you having money. He doesn't want you to have riches. And they're missing the point of the story because Jesus honestly doesn't care what you have. He cares what has you. He cares what owns you. He cares what your priority is. He cares anything that you're putting above him, anything that has your heart, that's what really matters to him. For this man, it was his possessions and money. But for us, it could be our family. And this this is something that Jesus preached over and over again. Look, Look here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. He says, if you cling to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Matthew 16, 25 says it this way. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. It is the message of the gospel. It is the story that Jesus would tell over and over and over again. And for this man, it was his money. But isn't this true of our families as well? That we have a really hard time sometimes giving up our idea of what we want for our family. We can hang on so tightly to the picture of what we wanted or the dreams that we had or the goal of what we really want in life that we're afraid to truly let it go. And instead of asking God, what do you wanna do with this? We come to God and say, tell me how to get this. Instead of saying, God, take this thing that you've given me and do what you want with it. See, one of the things I know to be true is that family can be an idol or family can be a blessing. When it's a blessing, as it's intended to be, it constantly points you back to God. It constantly points you back to the father heart of God, the marriage relationship we're supposed to have with Jesus. It points you back to this intimacy you're supposed to have with your family and your friends in the church. There is a vulnerability that must be there and and that opens us up to that. that. This is the picture that we're supposed to get, but when it's an idol, it actually takes us away from God. And I've seen people that have chased their family, this picture that they wanted to have, and they've run around doing all of these things, trying to create the perfect family, and they actually lose the very thing that they're chasing so much for. And that's painful to see, but it's a principle that is true. And I put it this way in my notes, that when pursuit of things is greater than pursuit of God, you make a God, lowercase g, out of the things you pursue. So as we get into this time where we're going to pursue our our family maybe more, our relationships a little more, we have to make sure that that's not the number one thing we're really pursuing, that it's not this idealized version of family that we're truly after. We have to lay down our idealized version of family or what we may want for it and pick up what he wants for it. We have to surrender it to the cross and seek first the kingdom of God. That's what it says in Matthew 6, 33. If you will seek first the kingdom of God, then all of these other things will be added to you, but it comes on the other side of seeking first the kingdom. There's a couple of books that I'm reading to prepare for this series, and uh, one of them is called The Storm-Tossed Family by a man named Russell Moore. And I thought this quote, quote was really great when on this topic. He says, if we seek first the kingdom, we are better able to seek the welfare of our families. If we love Jesus more than family, we are freed to love our families more than we ever would have otherwise. If we give up our suffocating grasp on our family, whether that's our idyllic view of family in the now, our nostalgia for the family of long ago, or our scars from family wounds, which we're going to talk about in this series, or our worries for our family's future, we are then free to be family, starting with the place in the new creation family of the church. 
This is the power of letting go. We have to let go of that suffocating grasp that we can have on our family and trust God that he's going to resurrect it the way that he wants to. This is the power of the cross. This is another message that's constantly in the gospel that whatever you want to uh, in life, you have to let die so that God can resurrect it his way. And that's the same thing with our families. And as I was reading this book, I came across this, this topic of when Jesus was on the cross. If you remember, when Jesus was on the cross, it, he said this one phrase that was so hard to understand. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And having introduced the familial relationship of father, that's difficult to read. That's like saying his father turned his back on his son. And for some of you, you've read that before and said, I get it. My dad turned his back on me too. I get what Jesus was going through. But that's not really what was being communicated here. In fact, Jesus wasn't the first person to say those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Actually, it was said by David a long, long time ago in Psalm 22, which is a song. Look at Psalm 22, verse 1. I'm sorry. I think we skipped ahead one. There we go. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David said this. A long time ago in a song in the Psalms, he said, why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Now, Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm. It is a song, but it is speaking about Jesus on the cross. It's a foreshadowing of the future. You can go read it yourself because in the middle of this passage, as David is talking about his pain and his suffering, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Later it says, my bones were out of joint, not broken. My mouth was dry. My hands and feet were pierced through. They cast lots for my clothing. All of those things, by the way, are things that happened to Jesus before and on the cross. So this is a a messianic prophecy about Jesus. So when Jesus was on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Jews in that time would have known that he was referencing Psalm 22. Now, back then, they had to memorize scripture. They didn't have it like we had. We didn't have, they didn't have iPhones with the YouVersion Bible app on it. They didn't have small Bibles. Nobody got to carry around the scripture. So they had to memorize the scripture. They had to get it into them, especially the Psalms. So what would have been a, a very common thing in this time is if you wanted to tell somebody a part of a scripture, they didn't, again, have chapter and verse either. That was added later for us as reference points. You would start the Psalm out with the first line. Like if you're trying to remember a song, you're like, give me, the, give me the line, give me the first line. Have you ever done that? Like, just give me the first line. I can remember the song, right? And, and some of you, even to this day, if I said, whoa, we're halfway there, you'd say, see, it's just not even, see, it's not even, we're not even living on a prayer, right? But, but you knew the song, like you knew the song. So what Jesus would have been doing, and I was talking to some people who live in Israel and have studied this same passage out as well, they they believe the same thing, that Jesus would have been saying, I want you to go and remember this song of David as I'm saying this, because it's actually a song of redemption. In verse four, it actually says this, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and in you they trusted and were not put to shame. So in this moment on the cross, Jesus wasn't communicating his distrust in the Father. He was communicating his trust in the Father and saying, if you'll go back and remember this, I know that I'm going to be delivered. I know that I'm going to be rescued. I know that he's not allowing me to be put to shame. What's coming on the other side of this is a part of redemption. He had been telling them that the whole time anyway, they just couldn't hear it. And if you fast forward down to verse 27 in, in this Psalm, it says, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. This is a, a generational redemption that he's talking about on the other side of the cross. Verse 30 says this, posterity or children or our offspring shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord uh, to the coming generations that they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. This is a reminder that on the other side of the cross, children will serve the Lord. It's a reminder of of the coming generations will turn to him, that the unborn will hear about his goodness, that he has already done the work. What I love about this picture and this passage is, is that if you want hope for your family, it has to be tied to the hope of the cross. 
Hope for your family is tied to the hope of the cross, that whatever you lay at the feet of Jesus, whatever you allow to die, it will be resurrected the way he wants it to be resurrected. Not our picture of it, but his picture of it. Not what we want out of it, but what he wants out of it. And I thought it was important that we start this series talking about this because it's the building block for everything else. And I believe that he's asking all of us today the same question is, will you trust me? Will you trust me with your past, your present, and your future? Will you trust me with the thing that's the closest to you? This is the same thing that he was trying to get across to the rich young ruler. In fact, if you read further in Mark 10 in the next sections, Jesus says something that is hard for everybody to understand. He said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples are like, that's insane. Like nobody then could ever do this. It's impossible, Jesus. And Jesus said, yeah, with man it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And I would just say today, maybe you're facing some impossible situations in your family. Past hurts, current situations. Maybe you think it's impossible. I could never have restoration in this area. And I just want to remind you what Jesus said right there. Yeah, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible when you surrender it to him. So they're saying, this is difficult. This is hard. Who could do this? And then Peter, as Peter always does, (laughs) but this time it was different. Peter speaks up and in, in verse 28, he says this, And Peter began to speak up and he said, we've given up everything to follow you. He's saying, what about us? We've given up everything. We dropped our nets. We dropped our careers. We dropped everything for you, Jesus. Goes on and Jesus says this. He says, yeah. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now. Many translations say in this life. Many will receive, it will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution because following Jesus, he's trying to let you know it's not an easy road. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. So in the next life, you'll have eternal life. But in this life, in this life, What he's not saying is I'm gonna give you a hundred houses. Some of you are like, I heard that. That's the wrong thing. That's the right actions with the wrong motivation. He's not saying you're gonna have a hundred wives. My wife was like, not a hundred wives. I was like, it doesn't say wives on purpose, sweetie. But what he is saying is first of all, you're gonna get the family of God, which is a hundred times more than you had before. But what he's also saying is in this life, I'm gonna bless whatever you surrender to me. If you surrender it to me, I can do something greater than you could ever imagine with it. One of the things that I'm always telling people as I counsel them for marriage, I counsel them for their kids, I'm saying, are you willing to lay it all before the Lord and pursue Him whether they never come back or not? Otherwise, if you're only doing it to get them back, when they come back, you're going to quit following Jesus again. It's the right things with the wrong motivation. Are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to let go? Because what I know to be true, it's so hard to let go of the things closest to us. We can grasp so tightly, especially with our kids, and think we've got to control the future. You're not in control of their future. God's in control of their future if you surrender to him. So the question that I'm posing to all of us today is that God, listen, God can't give you his best while you're holding so tightly to what you think is best. Closed fists don't get gifts from the Lord. They're his gifts. Family's a gift. It's a gift from God. And if we'll surrender it to him, let, it, let our idea die, I promise you he'll resurrect something different. And that's my prayer for you. Would you take a minute and bow your heads with me? And let's just pray today. God, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the cross, Lord, what you did for us on the cross that allows us, first of all, to be brought into the family of God, but allows our families to be redeemed, God. I just pray today, Father, for every single person here today, including myself, God, that we would choose to let go. Let go of our tight grasp on our marriage. Let go of our tight grasp on our kids. Let go of our tight grasp on our familial relationships and the dreams and ideas that we had that may not be what you have. 
we surrender those to you today. If that's you today, would you just, if you, that's your prayer, I want you just to open your hands where you are and say, God, I let go. Let it be a symbolic thing. I let go of this so that you can have your way in it, God. Even if this is at some point in the future, I let go now so you can give me what you want when it comes to family. We trust you with it, God. And maybe you're here today or you're watching online. And I think it's the perfect opportunity as we start this series. Maybe you haven't truly chosen to follow Jesus with your life. Maybe you're still holding on to your life. And listen, this is the message of the gospel. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it die and pick up his version for your life. Let him give you his life in place of your life. And with every head bowed today, maybe you're here today. And I just, if that's you, would you just slip your hand up and say, I want to, I want to choose to follow Jesus today. I've, I've wandered away and I'm coming back today. Or maybe for the first time. Thank you guys. I see your hands. I want to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to ask all of us to pray this. That's just a declaration of our heart position towards God. Let's just say, Jesus, I come to you. I choose to leave behind my old life. And I choose to follow you. I receive your life. I receive your family. I'm yours today. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate with those that made that decision. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. I pray this message encouraged you, inspired you, and maybe even challenged you a little bit. If you made a decision for Jesus, we are celebrating with you. Welcome to the family of God. We would love to know about it. So message us online or you can text yes card to 903-200-3808 and let us know what decision you made. We wanna come alongside you, help you find a local church. It's very important to be connected to the local body of Christ, whether with us or somewhere else. So let us know so we can help you and let you know your next steps with Jesus. I'd love to see you real soon in person, but until then, know that I'm praying for you. I'm praying God's best in your life. God bless you.